Hey guys, Capital Cosm here. Before we start this video, I just want to let you know that I believe that we are on the cusp of a major uranium bull market. Now, these things don't happen every other week. The last uranium bull market peaked in 2007, the one before that, in 1978. So when these things happen, you've got to take advantage of it. And how explosive are they? Well, you've all heard the stories, uranium skyrocketing from $10 to $20, all the way up to $150 in these uranium bull markets. Where will it go this time around? Well, we don't know. We'll see. But you've got to take advantage of the opportunity. What better way to do that than to leverage Justin Hune's Uranium Insider newsletter? You get access to his monthly newsletters, his webinars, his stock picks, his portfolio, all of that stuff. You get access to guests that you may not see on YouTube. You get access to having them ask questions that you may not see anywhere else. So I highly recommend if you're going to take part in this uranium bull market, you check out Uranium Insider. Link is down in the description box below. Be sure to click the link. There's quarterly plans, there's annual plans. So if you're kind of tepid, you're kind of hesitant, you could always go with the quarterly plan, kind of test things out, sample things out, see if you like it or not. But the way I see it, guys, you know, you've got to pick the right stock. A lot of these uranium companies are not going to make it to the other side. Now, and, and Justin Hune's uranium portfolio has outperformed the likes of URA by a significant margin. Since 2019, it's up 5x from where it started. So click the link down below and we'll get started right now on the video. Thanks, guys. I was We shot a video there and we were kind of contrasting uh, healthcare to to nuclear. And I'm, I'm a medical doctor. Um, you know, healthcare leans on a, a, a very complex series of, of, you know, pharmaceutical medical device supply chains. You know, hospitals in themselves are, are pretty uh, enormous buildings with a lot of different systems, um, a lot of things that can go wrong, a lot of quality control, et cetera. So there's some strong analogies between healthcare and nuclear. But of course, you know, the public face of healthcare is doctors and nurses. Um, and the public face of nuclear is, is that, you know, monolith of concrete that you saw. Um, and because unfortunately, um, particularly post 9-11, um, the security concerns, we don't get a lot of interaction with those people. And so that's kind of what we tried to do in this video is show some of the human faces. And, um, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes about the Gulf states. Um, and there's a lot of diversity, I think, between them, particularly in terms of, uh, you know, attitudes towards, uh, uh, you know, women and things like that. And about 20% of the people working at the plant uh, were women, uh, including some of the most senior reactor operators. So that was a kind of interesting little uh, side discovery of being in the country and, and seeing the nuclear power plant. Yeah, I mean, I'm mean, looking at this uh, plant here. I mean, it's just it's on spy number one because you don't see this level of engineering or architecture anymore here in in modernity. You know, you've really got to go back a hundred plus years to see like grandeur like this. So you know, it's definitely I I could see why you know um, you, you get a sense of awe from it. Um, I also know that you've been, you told me just before we hit record on this uh, interview, uh, you've, uh, you've you've been traveling the world um, generally, not just COP28. So any uh, inter interesting findings you want to report back on from your journeys? Yeah, sure. So I was in Australia um, in August and September of this year. I was invited by the Minerals Council. And Australia is a really interesting country. Um, you know, there's this joke that it started off as a British colony, uh, then became an American colony, now it's a Chinese colony. Um, you know, this is really kind of blunt force way of looking at it, um, but it's kind of a mineral version of a petro state. Um, a huge amount of their economy comes from mining. They have, you know, probably some of the richest iron ore deposits in the world, um, you know, 60, 70% iron ore that they can just easily dig and ship basically um and that's taken off to china where it's refined and turned into the steel that has you know led to the enormous um you know unrecognizable changes in china in terms of you know small cities turning into metropolis metropolises etc um and australia uh you know it's it's power system is largely coal fired uh, but there's been a rapid deployment of renewables, uh, particularly uh, rooftop solar, a lot of subsidies in place there. And there's a plan um, to move from, they're about 35% renewables now, and that includes actually quite a bit of hydro, but there's a, a very ambitious plan to move to 85% renewables. So with mostly additions of, of wind and solar. And they're sort of starting to crash into a, a bit of a reality check there. Um, you know, we see with early deployments of renewables that, um, you know, there's challenges, but when you're adding on to a reliable, dispatchable system, um, 
you know, for 10, 15, 20% deployment of renewables, that's, that's manageable. Uh, but once you move beyond that, particularly as you start retiring your dispatchable power generation, you start to run into some real problems. There's been skyrocketing prices, for instance, is, uh, occurring, occurring in Australia and even, um, uh, blackouts uh, that are starting to uh, be threatened, particularly as the three years of La Nina turn into an El Nino. So it was uh, it was really interesting being there. Um, the Minerals Council. I was I was wondering. I was like, why why do you want me to come and speak uh, about nuclear? I mean, isn't the renewables transition excellent for you guys? I mean, we're gonna have to turn the Earth's crust inside out for all of the rare earth minerals and lithium and iron and and copper that will be required. Um, but they're genuinely worried about staying competitive and, and powering their operations. Um, you know, there's a lot of mines that aren't grid connected, but those that are, um, you know, draw a significant amount of power from the Australian grid. And if that grid becomes completely viable, um, you know, running a mine or any industrial process off of intermittent energy, just, it's a, it's a, not a winning, um, not a winning enterprise. So, um, it was very interesting being in country, you know, meeting with some of the titans of the mining industry, but also a lot of politicians and, and policymakers, um, and seeing this real world experiment, um, in an aggressive move to deploy, deploy, deploy more and more renewable energy and seeing it starting to hit that, that critical, um, inflection point at which it becomes very difficult. So for instance, to start balancing and moving power around the country, they're working on a, um, pumped hydro station, uh, called Snowy 2.0, uh, and this this project started at a budget of about two billion, and it's it's ballooned to twelve billion now, um, and it's, it gives you about two gigawatts of of capacity for three or four days. So it's not a small project, um, not insignificant, but it's requiring you know massive amount of transmission lines to be built through national parks to try and uh, again be able to shift power around the country regionally um, to make up for the intermittency question. Um, and, you know, you look at this and you think 12 billion, you probably could have built a couple of gigawatt scale reactors that instead of giving you power here and there for, you know, uh, to firm up renewables, you could have firm power generation again with a capacity factor of instead of 15, 20% for pumped hydro and not even being a source of power, but just a, a battery, you could have had a power source that was online again, 95% of the time. And that could preserve some of the industries because again, I mean, you have uh, a lot of aluminum smelters, for instance, in Australia, um, if those uh, aluminum smelters run cold, the whole factory is kind of a write-off. Um, and so uh, there's real dangers of that as, as again, they try and move aggressively to shut down their coal fleet uh, and, and replace it with a, a, a power source, which is nothing like coal in terms of, uh, again, the, the services that it can uh, provide to power large cities or, or uh, large industries. So it was... It was a fascinating case study and, you know, very different, obviously, than the UAE. And so it's been a real privilege to, to travel around and and get to, uh, you know, learn uh, and, and study and, and, again, meet high level policymakers and, and industry folks and, and sort of piece this this whole energy thing uh, together and these, these attempts at energy and energy transition together. Yeah. So along your journeys, did you come across any other energy source outside of nuclear power that gets you as excited or that you see could take care of a good chunk of baseload power also you know, outside of fossil fuels as well, or is nuclear simply the best, most practical option uh, moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I think there's some excitement right now about advanced geothermal right now. Um, geothermal is very confined to essentially, you know, faults in the earth's crust. Um, so there's a little bit going on, for instance, in, in California, there's, uh, I believe some down in Indonesia, um, Iceland is, is sort of your case again example, right, where uh, about 20% of their power generation uh, comes from geothermal, you'd think, I mean, it's famous for that. Um, you think that it would be more actually about 80% is, is from hydroelectricity, just showing you again, what a what a, um, you know, incredible source of power hydroelectricity is. Uh, but uh, advanced um, geothermal holds out the promise of being able to pull heat from dry rocks. Um, which potentially opens up a lot of geography to being um, conducive to power generation from geothermal. It's not enough, uh, certainly, to provide the majority of the world's power by any means. Uh, and there's a lot of wrinkles to be figured out um, to see, you know, how sustainable it is. You can only pull so much uh, heat from rocks far below the surface before those rocks start to cool off. But essentially what it's doing um, to think about it just uh, conceptually is leveraging everything we've learned from the fracking revolution. Um, in order not to pull hydrocarbons out of uh, tight shales, for instance, but to, you know, pump water down, frack formations, get a lot of surface area to draw heat from those rocks and bring it back to the surface. So 
Um, outside of, of nuclear, um, that's an area I'm definitely keeping my eyes on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I continue to be pretty fascinated by nuclear. And in terms of, again, the, the, the problem with the clean energy transition is not to make lots of clean energy. Um, it's to replace fossil fuel services. So, you know, if you produce tons and tons of, of solar or wind when you don't need it and you dump the power, you're not really making a lot of progress. Um, the reason that I find nuclear to be fascinating is that it can replace some fossil fuel services, stationary power generation, again, low and medium grade process heat, even some applications in propulsion. Obviously, the nuclear Navy um, shows that we can use nuclear to, to move ships around, how applicable that is to the global fleet. Lots of challenges there. Um, but it also is, uh, you know, a bit of a sobering experience to think about all the things nuclear can't do and the fossil fuels, which are hardest to replace. And that would definitely be uh, the liquid hydrocarbons, primarily, um, you know, oil and its derivatives. Um, you know, if you start looking just at, for instance, um, the cornflakes you might have had for breakfast this morning, and you look at the supply chain that that brought that to your table um, and the contributions of, of oil and liquid hydrocarbons, it's it's absolutely bonkers from you know, the natural gas-based ammonia fertilizers, uh, the oil-based pesticides, the diesel tractors that, you know, sowed those fields and harvested the crops, the trucks that shipped uh, that grain to a grain dryer, where again, probably natural gas was used to dry out the grain and then the grain being shipped to a mill run by fossil fuels. And, you know, there's about five or six, if you draw a diagram, five or six uh, connections of just, you know, moving um, the products around until you get finally to the warehouse and the grocery store. And then you use, you know, liquid hydrocarbons to, <laughs> with your car, drive that, that box of cornflakes back to your house. And so when you start to really appreciate, uh, supply chains in the way that, that, uh, that energy works its way in and particularly the liquid hydrocarbons in terms of just greasing the movement of products and people, uh, within our economies, you realize the, the daunting challenge of actually replacing fossil fuels. And, you know, I've come to the conclusion that, um, you know, just as Homo sapiens emerged as a species in a marriage with the control of fire, Homo industrialis, um, our modern industrial form of, of, of human being and the 8 billion of us on this planet are really married, um, you know, can't live with them, can't live without them in a relationship to, to fossil fuels. So I'm going on a little bit of a philosophical rant here. I'm, I think I've, I've left far behind the question that you asked, but, um, you know, these are some of the things that are, that are on my mind um, and nuclear again, can replace some fossil fuel services quite well, electricity, power generation. But uh, yeah, um, I don't see a viable replacement, for instance, uh, beyond sort of the pilot project stage for things like uh, diesel or bunker fuel, et cetera. Yeah. So homo industrialis, is that an actual term? You know, someone else probably thought of it before I did, but, you know, I'm using it now. Yeah. Always take credit when you can. So, yeah. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Uh, cornflakes, you know, carbs and seed oils first thing in the morning though you know I, I, i'm not a doctor but you know i <laughs> i kind of steer away from uh cereal um in general but um but yeah i totally get your point we're swimming in a sea of energy so um and that's where mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the achilles heel to a lot of these um renewal uh, people championing renewables and um alternative sources of energy is that they don't have a sufficient appreciation in the sense that fossil fuels are ubiquitous in day-to-day -day life so and they're 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 invisible and they're they're invisible even in our economic thinking when you think about classical and neoclassical economics uh it's all about capital and labor and sometimes technology gets worked into that in terms of you know the labor theory of value you know a person with a lever can do more than a person just trying to lift a boulder up but what's neglected or treated as just any other input in economics is is energy itself. And it's amazing that we can do that given how incredibly valuable it is, but it's because we've had this enormous surplus of fossil fuel energy. Um, there's a guy I follow uh, named Nate Hagens who does some of the math on this, but you know we um, use about 100 billion barrel of oil equivalents. Uh, so about 36 billion barrels of oil. Um, and then if you take the energy in that and you kind of, again, this is sort of abstracting things, but think about how much natural gas and coal we use. It works out to about 100 billion barrels of oil. Um, and the energy in that um, is equal to um, the labor that about 500 billion humans could do. And so we essentially, if you want to think about it, there's a sort of army of 500 billion slaves worth of you know human labor equivalents that is doing are doing tasks for us whether that's moving cars boiling water um you know air conditioning whatever that would look like mowing the the lawns sowing the fields 
Um, and the idea that we can retire 500 billion laborers uh, worth of energy uh, and move on to other flows of energy, which in turn require fossil fuels for their construction. I mean, we have these pilot projects. We can maybe do green green steel, um, you know, using uh, hydrogen instead of uh, coking coal, for instance. Um, they're not economic. The reason that we can sort of play around with these pilot projects is because we have an enormous surplus of wealth uh, emerging from not labor or capital, but from energy itself, uh, from fossil fuels. And so, yeah, it gives you a sense, and again, a bit of, um, I keep using the word sobriety, uh, but in terms of some of the excitement we see about uh, the energy transition, we are ignoring um, just a tremendous, tremendous amount of energy, which is, you know, making our, our modern, you know, industrial civilization uh, possible, but also our sort of flirtations with so-called green energy. Um, and without uh, all of the surplus value we get from it, you know, it's it's there's this idea that you know Bill Gates uh, and others have put forth this idea of a greenium, right? So, if we're willing to pay a bit of a higher price um, for something like solar electricity, eventually innovation will drive that price down, and it will be more competitive than its fossil alternative, and will make the healthy you know climate choice, and you know pick green options like electric vehicles or whatever else that it might be. But you know, ultimately almost all of these uh, green energy schemes are less energetically viable than fossil fuels. And so, you know, you can innovate to a degree and make them slightly more efficient, but ultimately the use of, you know, pulling something out of the ground and burning it, it's, uh, you know, not easy. It requires some engineering, but it's almost always far more favorable um, than the alternatives. And again, if we don't have that 500 billion uh, you know, human laborers worth of energy anymore, we retire those folks, then we return to, you know, our industrial, our pre-industrial flows of energy of, you know, wind power of, of, of some hydro, et cetera. And the kind of civilizational complexity we saw with that, that's, that's what we will return to. So, you know, it's a bit of a Gordian knot um, and nuclear unties a few of the threads, but uh, you know, it's, it's not a, not a solution, unfortunately for, for climate or for, for the energy transition. Yeah. Yeah. So throughout the course of this interview, we've been speaking a lot in terms of I, uh, idealism, you know, how things should be, but how do you think things will play out well, regardless of what we think should? should in regards to nuclear, yeah. in regards to energy, in regards to climate? Um, we... Let's just say in regards to energy um, and how nuclear fits into that. Yeah. Well, first off, um, there's, there's not going to be a phase out of fossil fuels, you know, this decade, this century. And this millennia, millennia, I think, you know, we will continue to use fossil fuels until um, they're severely depleted. Um, and I don't say that with any joy. Um, I'm very concerned about climate change, and I wish there were a viable alternative um, that, again, could sustain 8 billion human beings on this planet. Um, so, you know, fossil fuels are definitely here to stay. Um, I think the first uh, bites that we'll feel in terms of fossil fuel depletion will be in the liquid hydrocarbons. You know, there was uh, obviously a big peak oil movement in the early 2000s. It was kind of ridiculed as, as fracking came in. Um, and fracking definitely has kicked the can down the road. And, you know, I think stats from this year show that the U.S. is producing more oil than it ever has. Um, that being said, we are fracking the source rock and we're seeing signs of, uh, of peaking, um, within, uh, you know, a number of the, uh, of the shale basins. Um, and so that's going to have, um, you know, consequences down the road, um, which are maybe a little too much to get into here. Nuclear, I think, um, again, gets deployed for pragmatic reasons, primarily energy security. So I think we will see a return to nuclear, um, in places that don't have sufficient fossil fuels, um, and, and places where um, geopolitics or uh, geopolitical tensions are particularly strong. So in Eastern Europe, um, Western Europe, definitely a number of the signatories of the pledge to triple nuclear are there. And we've seen a huge turnaround. Um, France was planning on phasing out its nuclear fleet. Uh, Sweden had uh, also made similar moves. Um, and uh, you know, a number of countries in Western Europe have have turned a corner on that and are, are planning, um, you know, aggressive nuclear buildouts, whether they have the um, kind of organizational capacity to do so at scale remains to be seen. Um, in the U.S., I'm I'm very uh, bearish on, on nuclear in the U.S., unfortunately. Uh, just it's it's such a mess. Um, I don't see credible institutions deploying nuclear um, that are that are able to, um, you know, get organized. And again, the lesson we see over and over again is, you know, pick a reliable technology with a solid operational history, a record, um, and you know, pick one or two designs 
designs, maybe a couple different sizes, but of a similar design and just bang them out. Um, and that's what, you know, France did. Um, that's what we did up in here in Ontario, where we, you know, brought 22 large candor reactors online in 22 years. So um, maybe I'll just wrap up by saying I have a lot of hope here in, in Canada. Um, we do have, you know, large publicly owned utility called Ontario Power Generation. Um, we've been uh, keeping our nuclear industry very much alive. Um, our, our reactors have this uh, feature, which we can um, replace the core every 30 to 40 years. And because we've been doing that, while we haven't built anything in 30 years, um, our nuclear industry has been, um, you know, engaged in a lot of mega project management, uh, three or four billion dollar projects to swap out the cores of our reactors. Um, we have the institutional excellence and, you know, uh, thanks in part to some of the activism I've been involved with, um, we have uh, a real turnaround and, and support, you know, from the highest levels of government uh, federally, right down on provincially, um, and plans to deploy 6,000 megawatts of new nuclear here. So Ontario is a place to keep your eyes on if you're if you're uh, looking at nuclear in the West, I think. Um, but I guess I'll leave it there in terms of, uh, you know, my my broader predictions. Yeah, yeah. Excellent work. I mean, this is just amazing what you been you know seeing and encountering and you know talking to these policymakers and so forth and you're doing the lord's work as some would say 